we have started a series that I think is not going to be only in the month of January. There's a high chance, Pastor Henry, that we might spill over into a new month. I am not in a hurry to move past this idea of disrupting yourself. Gone are those days when the itch to start something new is great because sometimes the message is not received as intended. And so I think disrupt yourself is going to go into the month of February, we will see. But this series is about you. Every time a year begins, I want to talk to you, the individual. Not your partner, not your friends, not your colleagues, you, you the person. Because if you can start the year with you, it becomes easier to branch out and start to impact the world around you. And so disrupt yourself is about you, but then it will become about others. Last week, the message was a disruptive spirit. This morning, or this moment, the message is the disruptive moment. I'll explain what that is first before we read the text. A disruptive moment is that event, that incident, that accident, that announcement, that tragic event, that successful event, a dis disruptive moment is anything that happens to you, through you, for you, that takes you from one level to the next. A parent dies. A child dies. You get the promotion. Your scholarship is approved. You get the job. You get the contract. Something momentous happens that takes you from one experience to the next. Now, I must say that it is sometimes difficult to identify a disruptive moment when it happens. Sometimes you have to look back and be like, oh, so that's what that meant. Hindsight. But then there are times when the event is so clear, it is so in your face that you cannot deny this is a disruptive moment. Do you know why the Bible characters we celebrate are in the scriptures? The Bible is not a historical book. It's not an autobiography. It is a redemptive expression of God's involvement in human life. And so we hear about an Adam, an Abraham, a Sarah, a Deborah, a Jesus, a, a Peter, an, an Ananias, a Sapphira. All these people were pivotal to the story of redemption. And so when you think about Moses, you think about his birth, you think about him going to Pharaoh's house, all those are disruptive moments that we study and try to get a word from God. In the book of Romans chapter 15, the, the author says that these things were written as an example to us. And so when we see these men and women, boys and girls, go through their disruptive moments, we are able to see ourselves in our own. Amen. Amen. Now, in order to illustrate where a disruptive moment fits and what it looks like, I decided to go outside of my comfort zone when it comes to teaching. I know for those of you who are in sales, in marketing, entrepreneurs, business owners, CEOs, or any type of a job, if you are in the hotel industry, restaurant industry, if you are in manufacturing, if you are in technology, I think you know what this is. All right, let me, let me pull this aside so that everybody can quite see it. This is known as the S-curve, obviously by the shape you understand. Now, on this column, I don't know whether it's the y-axis or the x-axis, I wasn't great at math. But where it says performance, it can be growth, it can be progress, but whatever it is, it measures performance. At the bottom is time, which means that when any company or business begins, it goes through this first stage, which some people would call the struggle, right? Some would call it the struggle. You're bootstrapping your business. You're trying to collect capital. You're trying to find angel investors. You're trying to find people to come in and support this idea that you have. 
And during this time, you're trying to promote it, you're trying to uh, uh, get feedback, you're trying to create uh, prototypes, you're trying to sample the food, you, you do a soft launch and you do a soft opening. All this is called the struggle because you're doing everything you can to get to a place where it succeeds. This can apply to your own life, your career, your health, your relationship your spiritual growth, whatever it is, you go through the struggle stage of the S-curve. Now, when you get to this point where things begin to work out, all of a sudden, the investments are growing, the company is growing, the number of people coming into the restaurant, now you're making a profit, right? As they say, uh, is it every, uh, uh, most 90% of restaurants fail within five years, is that correct? I don't know, I'm not in that industry. What follows the struggle is now what is known as the stride. When you get to the stride, now everything's working out. You got more uh, uh, demand than supply. Everybody loves your product. Everybody's posting about it. Everybody's commenting on it. Everybody's hashtagging it. It could be a church. It could be an influencer, whatever it is. You get to the stride level where things are working out the way you want them to. But then... Like where Facebook is right now, you get to this place where you get stuck. Who else can join? Who else can sign up? Who else can come? Either we don't have space or we've reached the capacity. The network can't handle another subscriber. You get to the place where you get stuck. Ladies and gentlemen, life is not as perfect as this. In fact, you go through more S-curves than you realize. In your relationships, you could be here, but in your career, you're here. Your health could be here because now you're stuck. You could be experiencing anything. But what I want you to see using the S-curve, I hope you understood. I did my best. It's not my field, but I hope you understand. If you notice what takes you from the struggle to the stride is usually a disruptive moment. For the restaurant, for the church, it's a viral video. It's the right guest speaker. It's the right singer. It's the right ingredients that come together that take you from 10 followers to 10,000 overnight. You struggle for so long trying to be relevant, trying to be known until one day something great happens. You're invited to speak in the right place. You're invited to the right interview. You meet up with the right person that loves what you do and is willing to invest in it that it takes you into this disruptive moment that becomes a stride. If you're with me so far, let me hear you say yes. yes. Everybody has come into the new year, but each of us are at a different level. Some of us walked into 2024 with the struggle. Some of us walked in at the top of our game. We are, we are on our stride. Everything's going up. Everything's working out. The bank account looks good. The relationship is great. Everything is awesome. But then some of us started the year stuck. What do I do now? What am I going to do? What am I going to become? What is the next thing? What is it that makes people get stuck? If it begins with a disruptive, dis, disruptive moment, I want to identify what is known as a destructive motive. The company grows and now you want to do hostile takeover. Now you want to start fudging the books and you want to start creating a... Uh, 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 an impression that is not true. You are modifying the numbers. You're starting to do things in order to be seen to be successful. Think about this. Most companies started right here, and they got here. You got BlackBerry. You got, what was the camera thing? What was that? Yeah, you got Kodak. A lot of companies got here, and when they came to this point, they couldn't see a way forward. For a while, Apple managed to create another thing and go, but everybody gets to this place. Our job in preaching and teaching is to make you avoid this, but always identify this. Let's read a text. First Samuel, chapter 16. You know, any Bible character could fit this model. But this morning, I have chosen David. We are introduced to this young man in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And it begins with a mandate that God passes on to the prophet Samuel. David is not the first king of Israel, but you would think he is. Because 
It is not called the city of Saul. It is called the city of David. Saul came in tall, dark and handsome, looking like a king. But for Saul, like most leaders, he struggled, but never hit a stride. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, God has rejected Saul and he comes to Samuel because Samuel, like any preacher or pastor or leader, is emotional about the decision for Saul to be king. And he wants it to work out. But God says to him, now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill up your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man whose name is Jesse because one of his sons will be anointed king. Ladies and gentlemen, if I had not read the text and if I asked you, what was the disruptive moment in David's life? What would you say? Anybody? What would you consider a disruptive moment in David's life? Go ahead, talk to me. What was that? David and Goliath, right? Everybody knows the David and Goliath story. It's used in economics, it's used in fighting, it's used in every arena of life. Even a non-Christian understands the concept of David and Goliath. But I'm here to tell you something interesting. That just because everybody sees the disruptive moment, it doesn't mean that's the one that God chose. David and Goliath is what we saw. But there's a lot of things behind the scenes that David experienced during the struggle that nobody knows about. And so I want to identify what I think is the disruptive moment. We could go back and forth. For me, David's disruptive moment is when Saul failed to be a good king and God said to the prophet, go to Jesse's house. Because without Jesse, there is no David. Without Obed, there is no Jesse. Without Boaz, there is no Obed. Without Ruth, there is no Obed. So if you want to learn the life of David, you got to go all back to Ruth. In fact, you got to go to Noah's Ark. Forget it, you got to go back to Adam and Eve. When it comes to God, your disruptive moment took place before you were born. We're talking about majesty. We're talking about sovereignty. God knows everything about you even before you were born. Before your parents decided when to have you. Whether you were planned or a mistake or you came too soon, God knew what he had in store for you. The Bible says that Samuel goes to Jesse's home and he asks him, bring all your sons because one of them is going to be king. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to throw this out there. It is a disruptive spirit. Last week we talked about it. It is a disruptive spirit that will get you to and will get you through the disruptive moments in life. It is the people who stay ready. It is the people who are always in preparation mode that are ready for what God has for them. You lost the job, work on something else. You lost the guy, the girl, work on something else. You're not doing great in this area, work on something else. It is the people who learn to disrupt themselves that can handle disruption. Do you understand? The one who's always upgrading themselves, skill-wise, health-wise, exercise-wise, they're always ready for the next thing. But the one who's not ready will never experience the disruptive moment. Let me paint a picture for you. I told you if Ruth had not been born, if Ruth didn't marry into an Israelite family, if Ruth had not remarried Boaz, David would not exist. But because of the choices of these individuals, David comes into the picture. Now, now, David is the last born. He's the youngest of eight sons. Because when it comes to the choice of who should be king, it made sense to Samuel, it should be the firstborn. Eliab was a soldier. The Bible says he was good looking, he was strong, he had presence. It made sense even to the prophet. The one God spoke to in his mind, this dude should be king. And God said, no, 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 no. You look at the outside, I look at the inside. Because when we choose leaders, let's be honest, We are looking for somebody that can take us through the stride. We want somebody that can increase the numbers. You want a pastor, he needs to increase the numbers of baptism and attendance. You want an employee, you want him to increase the sales. Nobody's looking for a leader to take you through the struggle. You know those seasons when nobody's interested in doing the work? When nobody's showing up? That's who God needs. 
Saul was a stride king. David was a struggle king. Are you listening? It is the disruptive spirit that will get you there. It is obvious that David was not led by fear. David was not a man who was led by fear. David was a man who had power, he had love, and for a while he had a sound mind. We all know that at some point his sound mind went out the window, especially when he was looking out the window. There are a few things that make David stand out. Why David? Why not Eliab? Why not the rest of his brothers? Why not Saul? Why not Samuel himself? He was a good candidate for king. Why David? So as quickly as I can, I want to go through what I describe as disruptive characteristics that every one of us can have. The first thing I want you to know about David, David excelled where he was. David excelled where he was. He has seven brothers. All of them are soldiers. But what happens to him as the last born? He becomes the shepherd. Now I know for you and I, being a shepherd sounds cool because Jesus is our shepherd, right? Pastors in the book of Ezekiel are described as shepherds. The pastor's wife is called a shepherdess. But in those days, being a shepherd was not prestigious. You literally spent the day with dumb animals. That's all you, 40 years, Moses was on the mountainside with sheep. That is not an elevated position. So when David, the young born, becomes a shepherd, it is not seen as an elevation, it's a downgrade. But what does David do? Let me fast forward, rewind, and hope you understand. Saul has been rejected by God. He's experiencing crisis of character, an evil spirit takes over, and he starts to get into a rage. He's throwing spears at people. He's depressed. He is feeling uh, egotistical and narcissistic. And so somebody says, you know what? We need somebody to come and sing for the king. And so listen to what this servant said. I think a lot of people have missed it. This servant came to me and said, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem, he is a talented harper. He is a man of war, a brave warrior, and he has good judgment. Do you realize that not only was David a shepherd boy, but he also trained as a soldier. Stay with me. David was not just, take, he didn't say to him, well, I'm the last born, I'll just take care of the sheep. It means that when his brothers were training and practicing their routines, David was at the back like a last born, just doing the same thing they were doing. And he picked up a skill that was actually part of the Israelite army, and that was a sling thrower. David chose to be a sling thrower. That didn't happen after. It happened while he was a shepherd boy. And so when God looks at David, he doesn't just see a soldier. He saw a king. David was good at being a shepherd because one day a lion and a bear came and David killed them. Don't slight that detail. Anybody ever seen a lion? No, no, I'm not talking about... Taman, Taman Safari. No, no, no. I mean a, a real, I'm not talking about those oversized cats. I mean an actual lion, okay? A Palestinian lion. A bear, not those little cub things that y'all got it. I'm not criticizing Taman Safari. I'm not a big fan of uh, zoos in general, okay? That's just cruelty to animals. But can you imagine this 17 year old boy defending sheep against a lion? If I'm David, guess what? I'm like, well, that's uh, five sheep that we won't miss. I'm going home. But the Bible says that David fought off a bear and a lion and he killed them for the sheep. So God saw something special in him, but his family did not. I, I, I really want to paint a picture here because even though his family may not have seen what he was, but somebody did. How is it possible that a servant in Saul's palace knew about Jesse's last born son? Who in those days looked at the last born? Now, if I'm Saul, this is not the guy I'm getting to come and sing for me. He's good looking. He's a soldier who writes music. That is not the person I want near my throne. But Saul is so confused that God uses his disrupted mind to bring David into the palace. Because when Samuel anoints David, Samuel walks away. Listen to me. The Bible says that when Samuel anointed David, he left and went to another city. He didn't take him through a king maker course. 
He didn't sign him up online for a free course on how to be the next king. He just left. David had to start figuring that stuff out on his own. And so when this job came, on, came up, David took it. He was a shepherd, he was a musician, and now he was serving the king. He excelled wherever he was. He didn't wait to be king, he did it before. Stop making deals with God. God, when my business succeeds, I'll train other kids and I'll teach the youth class and I'll do this. Start right now. Don't wait for the promotion to be the best employee. Start now. Don't wait for your partner to say, I love you, say it first, amen somebody. Oh, commercial break, over. Your faithfulness in the pasture will lead you to the palace. The, the, this is for the young people. I know everything's got to happen fast these days. Everything's got to come quickly like a text, like a post, like a like or a comment. But understand that your faithfulness with the dumb sheep will lead you to lead people. Your ability to show up and show out is what God needs. Amen, somebody. Let's go. I don't have a lot of time. Number two, not only did David excel where he was, the Bible also paints a picture that the anointing did not take away responsibility. I don't know if there are any last borns in the building. Technically, I am a last born. Gen X and bloomers will understand what that means. It basically means that one of the parents had other kids before the other one. Okay? Technically, I am my mother's last born. Until today, I am mm -hmm, years old right now. If you didn't hear it, watch the tape later, you might hear it properly. But till today, my brothers and sisters still call me little bro. I am a father and a husband, but I'm still little bro. Some of you call me pastor, they call me Sammy. But I'm telling you right now, if I'm anointed king, let me look at the camera because I know mama's going to watch this. Nobody calls me little bro anymore. You understand? But David is still the last born. The Bible says, not only does David have one job, he's got two jobs now. He works in the palace, he's anointed as king, but guess what David does? He still takes care of sheep. Oh, the reason you're not succeeding, the reason you're not progressing is because you're after the title, you're after the position, but once you get it, you let go of responsibility. David still obeyed his father, even though he was anointed king. Are you all tracking this? Are we reading the same Bible? The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 20, Pastor, pray for me. I'm running out of time. Verse 20, David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. The King James says, as Jesse had commanded him. What's happening in the text is the, so the brothers who are soldiers are on the battlefield. And so his father says, take some food for your brothers. This is anointed David, shepherd David, singer to the king David. He's being told by his father, take some food for your brothers. Can you imagine being the CEO of a company and your mother calls you and says, hey, your brother has a doctor needs lunch, but he can't leave. Take him a sandwich. You're going to jump into your Mercedes Benz and go drop off the sandwich? That's what David did. And the Bible says he took those sandwiches, those, the, the bread and the cheese, and he took it to the battlefield. Ladies and gentlemen, disruptive moments are made up of little moments that are insignificant. The little things you do every day, faithfully, consistently, will show out and God will do something. Can you imagine when Jesse's servant went to the field to call David to be anointed king and David decided that morning, you know what, I'm tired of this sheep. I'm going to town to do karaoke. Can you imagine if he wasn't there, what would have happened? Can you imagine the Bible says he left early in the morning to go to the battlefield. If David said no to his father and said, I'm the next king of Israel, don't be disrespecting me. David would have never heard what Goliath said. David would have never fought Goliath and David wouldn't be spoken about today. So he left early when he was asked to do it. Young people, when your parents ask you to do something, do it early. I'm talking to my son, but I know he's not listening right now because he don't care. Do it immediately because the obedience you express to your parents and your bosses is a reflection of who God is in your life. The Bible says when you do a job, don't do it like you're doing it to a human being. Do it as if God is the one saying do it. And when you're faithful, God will take you to South Africa. He'll take you to Botswana. He'll take you to the Philippines. He'll take you to Indonesia. He'll take you anywhere. All you got to do is keep running your mouth in Jesus' name. Number three. Don't shy away from challenges. See, we are so 
averse to challenges that we always seek the easy path. We'll take a job because a friend works there. We'll take a job because we know somebody there. We'll get somebody to get us a job. We never go out of our comfort zone for God to bless us. But I want you to notice that David was not the type of young man who shied away from a challenge. Challenge number one, being a shepherd. No, no, challenge number one, being the last born. Challenge number two, being a shepherd. Challenge number three, defending sheep against lions and bears. Challenge number four, being anointed king and not knowing the job description. How many of you right now would be okay being crowned a queen or a king? Be honest, it sounds cool, but that's scary. But David said, let's go, I'm good to go. David arrives in 1 Samuel chapter 17. He gets to the battlefield. His assignment is to drop off food. You understand? He's there to drop off food, not to fight a giant. Listen to me. A disruptive moment will find you when you're not ready for a fight. He gets there, he drops the food off, and then he starts to ask questions. Who's the big-headed fool on the other side screaming against God's people? His brothers come to him and say, hey, stop asking questions. You are nothing but a shepherd boy. Because ladies and gentlemen, even though God has anointed you for an assignment, there's people in your life, people in your family, people in church right now that don't see what God sees. So without knowing it, they think they're doing it out of love. They'll try to stop you. Don't start the business. Don't start the relationship. Don't move out of the country. Don't take that course. Do this. Don't be that. Be this. They're doing it out of love, but sometimes they're standing in the way of what God is trying to do. So David doesn't stop because his brothers nagged him. He keeps asking, who is that man? And then the second question David asks, this is how confident David was. David says, what will the man pause? He is 17 years old and he calls himself a man. The king, the generals, the majors, and the captains all don't want to fight Goliath. But David says, what will the man that defeats this giant get? See, David is so confident. He's not worried about the battle. He's thinking about the reward. Come on, y'all. He's already thinking about what will I get when I drop this fool? And by the way, you got to marry the king's daughter. Your family got to be tax-free till they died and you became wealthy. So David looked ahead and he's like, you know what? My God is stronger than that joker. I've killed a lion and a bear. I can take him out, but let me find out what, what's in it for me. And so the Bible says David did not shy away from a challenge because God needs people who are willing to go through the struggle. Are you willing to take a demotion in order to be elevated later? Are you willing to do the things that other people won't do to get the job done? Are you willing to show up be paid less than you're worth until something happens. Are you willing to be in a company that is so small and not growing, but you're learning the craft and the trade? Are you willing to be taken to places where you'll never be recognized? You'll be judged by the color of your skin. You'll be judged by your qualifications, the name of your family, the tribe you come from. Are you willing to stay there until God elevates you? David said, I'll fight him. Gotta go. So I, I, I love all things space. And ever since my son was born, I've, I've, I've gained a love for it even more. And, and, and in reading about astronauts, I found out that whenever they spend too much time in zero gravity, in space or the simulated one at NASA or SpaceX, the months and the years they spend in the, in the, in the, in the what do they call that, the space station, right? What happens is weightlessness simply means that there's no pressure hitting your body, it's, it's, there's no gravity, there's nothing you are resisting. But here's the problem. When astronauts spend weeks and months out in space, they start to experience nausea and vomiting and headaches and their muscles atrophy. Meaning that because you're not using them as much, they become weaker. But on the other side, the girl, the guy who goes to the gym and works out, do you know every time you're working out, you're tearing your muscles? And then a growth hormone is injected, which that's what makes the muscles bigger. It's because they're torn apart and rebuilt again. Are you listening to me? Stop praying for zero gravity and start praying for struggles. Because it's the struggles that make you grow up. That boss that doesn't like you, that supervisor that doesn't want you to get the promotion, that keeps making you take the hard assignments, do it to your best of abilities. Because one day, muscle memory will develop and you'll become the guy. Or the girl, 2024, hashtag women rule. Okay. 
Everyone wants the elevation. Everyone wants to be elevated. But not everyone is excited about the preparation, let alone the confrontation. Because sometimes to get past a disruptive moment, you might need to go through some confrontations. Because some people want you at a certain place because it makes them comfortable. If you are less than them, then they feel better than you. David's brothers were comfortable him being a shepherd. But him being in the king's palace made them uncomfortable. And when you read 1 Samuel chapter 16, the Bible says David was anointed word for word in front of his brothers. Why did the writer add that detail? He wasn't anointed in private. It happened right in front of his brothers because God wanted them to know, all you see is a shepherd, I see a king. One day, David is going through the struggle and he writes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And somewhere in the psalm he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Sometimes you're going to have to feast in the presence of people that don't like you. And I know it's uncomfortable. I know we want to be liked by everyone. I know we want everybody to put us on a pedestal. But life is not like that. Don't be arrogant. Don't be rude. But keep going forward. Amen. Stay in your lane. Oh, this is hard for people. Stay in your lane. The social media generation does not... Uh, promote staying in your lane. It promotes being like somebody else. It promotes you taking up somebody else's si assignment because they succeeded. Let me try it also. But you need to learn to stay in your lane. David has agreed to fight Goliath. The Bible says that Saul is like, okay, young man, you want to do it? Fine. But here's what's going to happen. Take my armor, put on my armor, and go fight Goliath. Now, initially, David did not refuse. He tried on the armor because it makes sense. You want to have the breastplate, the, the, the leg plates and all the armor to protect yourself. It makes sense. But David tried it on. And notice what the text says. See, a lot of the time people have interpreted the text and said David couldn't use it because it was too big. No, it's not that it was too big. It's that he was not used to it. Are you listening? David was a sling thrower. David was a shepherd, and when he arrived on the battlefield, all he had was a shepherd's bag and a staff. No rocks in the bag, by the way. The bag was empty because he didn't come to fight. He came to deliver sandwiches. But now he's agreed to fight. He tries on the king's armor. And David says, I can wear this. I've never used it before. I'm not used to this. And so the Bible says he takes it off. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, listen to me right now. There are people in life who have failed at something. They want you to do it the way they failed to do it. Saul did not agree to fight Goliath. Who is he to tell David how to dress? Who is he to tell him, put on my armor? What armor? You're not wearing it yourself. There are people who are not in the job. It's like, it's like me getting to a hospital. I see a doctor treating a patient and having the conversation. And I go to the doctor, listen, I'm a pastor. And I think that the way you're doing it is not the right way. I feel that before the medication, you need to pray with them. You need to comfort them and ask them how they're doing. You know, like Jesus, right? You can't do that. Stop telling other people how to live their lives if you are not doing what God has called them to do. And pastor, you know this. People do this to you as well. People do this to me. Someone will come to the back and say, hey, pastor, the message was good. But next time, maybe you should say this. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I love you. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Amen? But it's okay to criticize me. It's fine. It's fine. I got tough skin. <sighs> Number five, go back to the basics. Go back to the basics. See, there's a temptation whenever God blesses us to the next level, we try to be something else. We try to be someone else. And pastor, we've gone through this where when the audience is 10 people or 15 people, you yourself. But all of a sudden when the audience gets bigger, you try to sound like another preacher that people love. You try to start using the man and Jesus said, you don't do that. It doesn't matter if it's 10 people or 500. Be Sam. Go back to the basics. What does this mean? When David says, I am going to fight Goliath, listen to what he did. He refused the king's armor. David did what he always did. He went, looked for five smooth stones on the stream. He put them in the shepherd's bag. Then he armed with a shepherd's staff and a sling. He went forward to fight Goliath. He did what he did every day when he woke up in the morning. Took the shepherd's bag, he took the staff, he picked some stones and took care of sheep. Over and over again, same routine. 
The only difference is he's not fighting lions and bears. He's fighting a giant, but he did the same thing. Ladies and gentlemen, go back to the basics. Listen to this quote. Achilochus. Achilochus is a was a Greek poet, and he said something that is repeated in the army. This is a mantra in the army, and it says, we don't rise to the level of our expectations, we fall to the level of our training. Okay? To those who play sports, badminton, soccer, basketball, you understand this. When is the fourth quarter? When is the last quarter? Or or, or in soccer, what is it called? The 90th minute. minute. You don't try something new. You go back to what you did in training. When the coach calls for a timeout, what does he do? He says, play number two, play number three, right? You go back to the basics because when it comes down to crunch moments, you don't work on what you expect. You're not all of a sudden going to dunk over LeBron. Go practice the shot. Stop fooling yourself. Don't try something new. Do the basics. And so David said, I'll do the basics. I'm not a soldier, I'm a sling thrower. He picked up some stones, he took his rod, and he took his bag, and then the Bible says he moved towards Goliath. Go back to your training. Go back to your training. Go back to your spiritual training. If God says pray and something will happen, do what? Pray. I don't care what stars of the zodiac you are, whether you are lying or... By the way, I always say this because (laughs) my wife is a dragon and apparently I'm a chicken. And this is the year of the dragon. So in my house, we are Christians. We're not doing none of that. I'm just hating because she's a dragon. Anyway, we don't do witchcraft. We don't go to fortune tellers. We pray. When we're stressed out, we read the word of God. Go back to the basics. Stop asking me, pastor, what can I do to overcome my depression? Really? Read, pray, consult, spend time with the Lord. He'll see you through all your disruptions with somebody. Say amen. Oh, Lord, my time is up. Final one. He was armed with a cause. It is people who have something worth living for or dying for that God can use. Now, I said both because it's not always that we need to die. Sometimes we need to live. If you're raising kids like how Moses' parents raised him, the Bible says that Moses' parents saw something special in him. But do you notice that even though Moses was special, he still had to be breastfed? He still had to be changed his diaper? They still had to do the basics. They did the basics until he was 12 years old. And then Pharaoh's uh, daughter took over the basics. And now we talk about Moses. But here's the thing. They were armed with a cause. Here's read the text. I know I'm moving fast. Forgive me. Verse 28. Eliab's anger was aroused against David. Eliab is David's older brother. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those sheep? Those few sheep in the wilderness. Are there siblings in the house? Do you have older brothers and sisters who treat what you do like it doesn't matter? Why are you here? Go take care of those few sheep of yours. We're soldiers. We're doing men stuff here. David responds and says to him, what have I done now? Right? That's the last born response. What have I done now? Why, why, Why am I irritating you? What have I done now? Can you imagine having a younger brother like me with a high pitched voice? That's gotta be annoying. What have I done now? Is there not a cause? I went back and forth with Pastor Henry on this text because in, the, in, 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 in different versions, it simply says, is it bad for me to ask a question? Is it wrong for me to express my thoughts? But I like the King James because it says, is there not a cause for me to ask, why are we entertaining this giant? 40 days and 40 nights, Goliath came in the morning and the evening. This is the time for prayer, by the way. While the priest is offering the sacrifice, Goliath starts to scream threats. How can they focus on worship when they're being discouraged? And so David says, is there not a cause for me to ask these questions? My brothers and sisters, I don't know you that well. I don't know what it is you're doing with your life. Maybe you don't have as many followers on social media. I've never seen you on TV. I've never heard your name being mentioned in the streets. But here's the thing. Anybody who has a cause can become great in God's hands. What is the cause that you have? Is it winning souls, Pastor Henry? Is it helping students? Is it helping the homeless? Is it raising a child, a son or a daughter to be the greatest they can be? What is your cause? Your cause will make you disrupt your life in ways you can never imagine. I'm done. Disruptive thought. I always end with a disruptive thought. See, disrupting yourself doesn't mean doing something new. No, you don't have to start doing new stuff. 
You just have to do the old stuff, but now you do it for something greater. Why am I raising my kids? Not so that they turn 18 and I can kick them out the house. No, no, I got a couple of Africans, they understand that. I know you guys are like, really? We're keeping them till they're 40. No, for us 18, you're out of the house, right? But if you start to raise your child, not to get rid of them, but to equip them, that's different. Why am I the pastor of the church? Because I want to see the crowd full to the back. I don't care about that. I want to see disciples, not followers. I want disciples, not an audience. What is it that is a cause that drives you? But even though you have a cause, just like Bill Gates, just like Warren Buffett, just like, I'm sorry, ladies, I'm trying to think of a billionaire woman, nothing comes. Oprah Winfrey, okay, whew, that was close. Oprah Winfrey. They got to wake up in the morning, brush their teeth, eat breakfast, but the difference between you and them is they don't scroll social media in bed at five in the morning. They're reading stuff that feeds them. Their 24 hours looks a little bit different, but they still have to do what you do. Lord, help me disrupt my life so that I can be a David, be a Deborah. Deborah was a mother. She wasn't a soldier. She was a mom. She saw her people struggling, and she decided, I'm going to start counseling and encourage them. She sat under a palm tree, and people started coming to her. That's how she became a judge. So it doesn't matter whether you're a stay-at-home mom or a career mom. I don't care. Have a cause. Sam, that's what I want in my life. If that's you, stand to your feet. No raising hands. Let's be courageous and say, Lord, teach me to disrupt my life so I can prepare for disruptive moments. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Dear Father, we listen too much to people who are trying to hold us back. Sometimes it sounds like it's coming from a place of love. And often it is. Because the temptation to protect the people around us is great, especially our partners, our children, the people that we hold dear. We don't want to see them fail, and so we stop them from trying something risky or something that will make them stand out. And yet, today, Lord, from David, we understand that the disruptive moment catches us when we're doing something else. But to the person that has already disrupted themselves, nothing surprises them. When the promotion comes, they're ready. When the demotion comes, they're ready. When death comes knocking at the door, they mourn like the rest of us, but they are ready. They bounce back, they fail often, they fail hard, and they fail forward. These are people who don't see setbacks as anything else than a step forward. These are the people who understand that sometimes in order to propel you forward, God has to pull you back a little bit, let you go so that you can go further. I'm praying for somebody in this room right now who has already started the year in a defeatist mindset. They've already decided that this year is going to be as bad as last year. There are people who are still fearful about another pandemic coming. There are people who are driven by the drop in the economy. There are people who are driven by sickness. There are people who are so stuck in what happened last year, they don't see what God is trying to do. Ladies and gentlemen, we serve the king and queen maker who is Jesus Christ. He is here to elevate you, not for yourself, but to the glory of his name. Yours is to show up. Yours is to do the work. No matter how bad and stinky the job is, keep doing it to God's glory. And I pray, Father, that as they disrupt themselves, no matter how scary and uncertain it is, I pray that you will be above them to watch over them. I pray that you will be beneath them to lift them up when they fall. I pray that you will walk ahead of them to guide them through disruptive moments. I pray that you will walk behind them, that they would never get too discouraged to see what God is doing. I pray that you will surround them to protect their minds and their hearts. I pray that you will walk by their side as a friend because sometimes disruptive moments are lonely. But above all, above all, please be in their hearts so that they can be like Jesus and take as many steps forward no matter how dark the valley is. If this is your prayer, let me hear you say amen. And amen. God bless you.